And the topics, if I were to show you the meetup page, the topics next week are GraphQL, which is a real slick way to get data for a, uh, a web-based app, and also Razor Pages. Okay. Um, hopefully you're signed up for that. There's about 90 or like 100 some people signed up for that one already. So now, when we have those meetings, what we may do is, um, I don't know if we'll remove these tables or not. Rich, you don't have any, you don't really have any extra chairs. We're pretty much maxed out on chairs, about seven left. Okay, so it doesn't make sense for us to remove the tables next week. We are just gonna go with a max of 80, uh, 85 seats. That's that's going to be our game plan. But lots of room to move around here. I like it. Um, so the uh, December meeting, which is I know it's pretty close to Christmas, but it's just the way the clock or the uh, the dates work out. Um, we're going to have a presentation, and uh, Chris Gomez, uh, another MVP, myself, and also Tony Bergoldi. We're going to show you an example of each of the three different frameworks. So you'll really understand a lot of this by the end of these couple months. All right, so React was actually invented at Facebook and it was invented by one of their employees and it was originally used for in-house apps and then eventually it was put into Instagram and Facebook parts of it. So it's very similar to the way Google works with Angular. A lot, of the, a lot of the Google pages are built using Angular. And the other very popular framework is called Bootstrap. And who's that by? Twitter. So that was, that was designed to run the Twitter website. And pretty exciting news this week. They took CSS and expanded it to 256 characters. That's a joke. I hate when you have to explain such a joke. So. All right. So uh, React is fairly new. It's only been around three or four years. Uh, Angular has been around more like seven or eight. And uh, they just released a major upgrade a month and a half ago. And we will be using that version. Uh, part of the new upgrade includes something called React Fiber. Uh, React Fiber is just a way that they sped up how React um, analyzes what should change on your page and display it. So <clears throat> the other thing it's, uh, React is famous for is this. Um, has anybody run into this where uh, when they originally released React, it used a restrictive license? <laughs> Okay, well, you're, you're welcome to go read about this. There's plenty of articles on the web. Um, but uh, just to, so you understand, the, the new release that just came out, 16.0, uses an MIT license, though it's sort of on a par with all the other frameworks now. So it's not as restrictive. And uh, if you're using it for major commercial work, that becomes an issue. So one of the React's claim to fame is it uses a virtual DOM. This is something Angular does not do. And the virtual DOM, rather than change all the elements in your DOM live, which causes the browser to adjust and try and re-render everything on the fly, what React does is it creates basically in memory a structure almost identical to your page. And all the React code changes the structure in memory. Then, you, uh, uh, if you think like a diff tool, like you would have in your in GitHub or in, you know, PFS or something, basically it looks at memory, it looks at the DOM, and it figures out which things need to be updated, and it updates them very fast and very efficient. Now, because it uses this approach, React usually is a little bit faster than the other frameworks, um, most notably Angular. So, um, and you'll see as we demonstrate this over the next couple of months, you'll see where the difference is. 
So that's a good thing to know. So we're going to be making something called components. All the new frameworks are now moving in this direction. And the components are actually part of the W3C standards. They're called web components. And typically, when you make components, you're going to use ES6 syntax. Does everybody know what ES6 is? All right to say no. OK. ES ECMAScript. I don't know where the ECMA thing came from. I, that, that's really ancient history. Uh, but basically, it's the next version of JavaScript. So most of you do not code in JavaScript 6 yet. But when you're doing this stuff, you will be doing JavaScript 6. So it is a little bit more like C Sharp. It has classes. It has imports, exports, and things like that. It, it can have type checking. So anyways, inside each of the component that you make in React, you have to have something called the render method. The render method then takes something that's going to be displayed on the screen. So typically in React, you're making either an entire page or you're making little tiny rectangles that would all combine together to form a page. And if you make a lot of components, the components can have children. So like if you have a component that is a list of names, then each of the names could be rendered by a child component that just knows how to display the name. And they refer to this as a component tree. And you pass data, you'll be doing all this very soon. You pass data into the components using something called props or properties. And then you can also do something called state. So props and state are very important. There's a syntax that they've developed so that you can easily make your markup. Some people really like this because basically you're writing HTML markup right inside of JavaScript. Again, you'll see it soon. I can show you. A little bit what it looks like. Um, it looks like that. So this is the code we're going to be looking at eventually. And this is a really, really, really bad example. So I will show you stuff that's easier to understand soon. OK. Did everybody see how smooth that was? Ready? You have to, I need sound effects. You ready? Ooh. <coughs> Ah, ooh, ah. So that's a cool trick. And you do that by using multiple desktops in Windows 10. So that way, you know how presenters always get like really confused when they're like showing their slides and they don't know how to get into their code again? There's a much better way to do it. All right, so JSX, um, now, did we put these slides somewhere so people could get them? Excellent. <laughs> One thing at a time. Got it. Okay, so let's go to the next slide because you're probably tired of looking at slides. Uh, the other thing that uh, React does, it does one way data flow. So the idea is. When you first play with Angular, there's a lot of two-way binding, and that can actually cause performance flags and things like that. In, in React, they're much more specific about how the, how the data flows. So for instance, if you have a property, the whole idea is a property is not supposed to change. So it's sort of a one-way passing of information. And they use these phrases in React, like properties flow down, actions flow up. So you have to think about what you're sending into a component, what it's going to display, and the component may trigger an event, and the event is going to send back. So, all right, time for your tooling. So everybody's supposed to have Visual Studio Code somewhere, somehow. If you could, we might as well start the hands-on on stuff now, OK? So open up Visual Studio Code. 
And this was something I was writing earlier, so I'm going to get this sort of out of the way. Okay. And it doesn't matter if you have a project open or not right now. It does not matter. What I want you to do is open the little window on the bottom here. If you don't remember how to do that, it's control back tick. The back tick is that backward accent thing. So open up a terminal window. Okay. When you open a terminal window, you are essentially doing command prompt stuff. On the right hand side, there's a little up arrow. It says maximize panel size. Go ahead and click that. So now we are running in a command, oops, sorry. We're running in a command line, okay? And even though I was doing stuff earlier, just like any command line, you could do a CLS and it clears the screen. Okay, so we're gonna use this to set up our development for today. So hold on a second, I'll jump back to the slides. So inside this command line or command prompt, you're actually going to be using something called node.js. Okay, so node is a JavaScript server. And can anybody tell me why all these modern uh, frameworks rely on node? What's that? Well, it is, but all the frameworks rely on a bunch of essentially open source tools. All the open source tools, most of them are written in JavaScript. And they're done that way because Node allows you on your desktop as you're doing development to basically have a JavaScript environment. So if you keep your desktop JavaScript environment up to date, you can easily run these tools and using the companion of Node called NPM, which stands for the Node Package Manager, you can go out and get new tools if you're missing one. We'll be doing that during the class. So your job, if you want to do this kind of modern development, you really have to understand how Node and NPM work. Have to. Also, <coughs> We're going to be writing something called ES6 or ECMAScript 6 and one of its variants called TypeScript. Okay. Can modern browsers run TypeScript out of the box? Absolutely not. Can they run ES6 out of the box? Some of the browsers like Chrome in the latest edition can run parts of it out of the box. So basically, almost anything you do has to be converted from the language you're going to be writing in today to something the browser can understand. That conversion is called transpiling. It's a cool word. Use it at your holiday party. I have to go transpile. So um, anyways, you'll be using um, something called Babel, very popular tool to con that converts ES6 into standard JavaScript 5, and TypeScript has its own transpiler. The other really popular tool now is called Webpack. How many people use Webpack every day? You really want to learn Webpack. We're not going to teach you that today, but Webpack takes all the code you write in a whole bunch of files and smooshes it all into one or two bigger files and it removes all the extra white space. Why on earth would you remove the white space? So you download things faster, it reduces the file size. So in the first couple exercises, I'm going to show you what it looks like when you transpile and also create these with their, what Webpack calls their bundle. 
that you send out as a plug. Okay, so show of hands, how many people use all of these tools on a daily basis? All right, we got one or two ringers here. <laughs> You're going to help the others, aren't you? Excellent. Okay. So the last tool I'm going to have you use today is called Create React App. That is provided by Facebook. And what that does is that scaffolds or builds an application for you. And you use that as a starting point. OK, so on the slides, which Rich is going to get somehow make available to you soon, um, you can see the instructions. So control back to opens the terminal. You can open multiple terminals. So let's just do that as an exercise. So we have a terminal open. You drop down this box on the upper right hand corner. We have a single terminal open. Hit the little plus sign. It says, would you like a second one? And then it says, you can change your default. Well, let's, let's not do that right now. So you could do PowerShell, which is a handy thing in a Windows environment. There are other options here. And you can just switch between these, and you could be doing different command line things at the same time. You don't really need to do this, but you know, it's useful if you are doing a lot of command line stuff. If you want to close one of your windows, just switch to it. Whoops. Hit the wrong key. If you want to close one of these windows, just switch to it and hit the little X up in the upper hand corner. And it closes that. Well, that closed the panel. My mistake. Uh, we still have two of them there. The trash can. So we're going to, that, that's pretty nasty. We're going to kill the terminal. Couldn't you just say politely close it or something? All right. So now I only have one of them. Okay. So everybody's happy with terminal. Okay, next thing I want you to do, Node-V. Anybody has a version better, higher than mine? What do you got? Seriously, 8.91 or 9.1? Ah. Oh, oh, if you're, if you're, I did the stable, you're on the fan, you're, I see. Okay, well, that's all right. It, it's going to work. Uh, yes, LTS is what it's called. It's uh, living on the, the long-term support. Okay. The other one you want to do is NPM-V. And that should give you the version of your node package manager. I have no idea why that number is so different from the one from node. It's just the way they do it. And it's silly because when you do node, it says V, 8.91. And when you do NPM, it just says 5.51. Yes. Newer? Um, well, we'll see how far you get. I, I can't promise. Because there are, what you'll learn when you get in the world of Node, there are a lot of dependencies. And if you want to use a new tool, it might only work with a newer version of Node. I don't know. I, I, you'll see soon. Okay. So going back to my slides, so we just did the two versions. Yes. All right, one of those guys. So there it. I mean, it's also we already use Facebook. Yes. Okay. So. Um, um, so yarn compete with MPM. And you can use it just as easily as you use MPM. However, I've been using MPM for like six or seven years. I'm just comfortable with it. And that's more uh, because I'm more of an angular guy. I, that's what I grew up with. Yarn, probably some people would argue could do some things better. But to me, they're sort of equivalent in what they do. It's the same thing with gulp and grunt and webpack. 
I have people that, that and if, again, if you don't know all these things, go look them up in Wikipedia. But but uh, people used to use Gulp, and then they switched to Grunt, or one or the other. And now everybody seems to be going to Webpack because it's like covers a lot more territory. So um, just if you get into this world, you got to be ready to learn these new things. And by all means, you should be trying several of them out just to understand what the options are. And that's part of why we're doing these classes. OK, so the next thing I wanted you to do, if you have not already downloaded this, did everybody run this command already that, what, where you create you that let's look at the syntax npm i stands for install you're going to install this thing called create react app and dash g means global global it stores it in a certain place on your hard drive so that any project you want to start has access to it where normally when you npm it only installs into the current working project directory or folder Hey, does everybody think they have that installed? The way you check is you do the following. You're going to do create react app dash dash help. And it has to be two dashes. And you should get a list of options. Well, we're going to do that next. And it's weird because if you do if you do dash V, it doesn't work. You have to do dash capital V. And I don't I can't understand why they did that, but they did. Okay, so I'm in version 1.43 of the Create React app. Now the other competing products have very similar approaches. In Angular, you're using something called Angular CLI. It has a lot more options than this one. However, Angular CLI, you must keep it up to date. This one you don't have to. The reason is that uh, they did something very tricky in Facebook. When you run Create React App, all it does basically is a, it's a, a sort of a wrapper or a proxy that goes out and downloads the latest script to install the latest step. And that is called React Dash Scripts. You don't have to know that, it's just what it does. Okay, so next step. <clears throat> we're gonna make an app. Now you were supposed to do this already. For those of you that didn't do it, uh, I will demonstrate it up here. And you can follow along. But basically, what I want to do is I want to, um, I'm going to CLS here so you can see things a little clearer. I'm going to go up one level. And I'm going to say create React app. And I got to give it the name of what I want to make. And I'm going to call it React app. It's that simple. And what this is going to do is it's going to connect over the internet to the NPM repository and it's going to download a whole bunch of stuff. I counted it uh, this morning and it actually downloads about 20,000 files. But the way the way node work, the, the way node works is there are lots of little tiny files, little tiny JavaScript thing. So we're gonna it's gonna be boring, but we're gonna stand here and watch this. Um, now, since some of you have already done this, why don't I go out and show you what it makes? So I'm gonna go to this PC and uh, what I'm gonna lo local disk code. Okay, so I've already made one called Create Re uh, React App Test. And if I go in and look at the properties, watch how many files it has.
21,335. That's what Hello World takes. That is correct. Some would argue this isn't a smart way to program, but basically everything is in this one called node module because public only has two files in it. Source has two files and then uh, I'll, I'll explain in a few minutes what build is. But when you go into node modules, this is what it's doing when you scaffold an app. It downloads all of this stuff. Now, if you compare this to the world of C Sharp, where you install the .NET framework one place on your machine, and then your projects reference those DLLs, that seems a lot more efficient than having to download 20,000 files in every folder, in every project you make. It's just the way people work with Node. Now, technically, some of this stuff could be downloaded globally, so you don't have to download it for each of the individual folders, but uh, it, it's just the way people work. Now, I want you to keep thinking about this, and I want you to go out and look at this, because suppose you want to write something, and you, you scaffold it, you make a little app, and you want to show it, and pair it with a buddy. Did you be copying all 20,000 of those files to your buddy? I always ask very obvious questions. The answer is, why, hell no, Bill. I don't want to do that. Okay, so what you do is you copy your thing without the node module. Well, if you don't copy the node module, how's it going to work? Exactly. So you copy it, give it to your buddy, or go up through GitHub, smarter. They download everything but the node module. Then they run a single command called npm install, and it reconstitutes the entire node module folder for you. So, that's, that's the basic concept of how this stuff works. Now, all of that eloquent talking was done so that you could see that I now have an error. And that's not good. <laughs> Who knows why that happened? So, that was uh, either it ran out of, uh, I don't know what it did. I, 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 what's that? Uh, that's a good point. I might have had to be an admin to do this. That's a good point. Um, got it. So, do I want to try and run this again? I don't know. I could probably do that. <sighs> yeah, it didn't even make the folder. Yeah, to do, and I think you're right, to do certain commands. So let's do that. So um, anybody that has to run this, if you have uh, not been able to run this, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to um, Visual Studio, and um, is it, it's, uh, I'm doing control, and I'm going to run it as administrator. And it'll come back up, and it should remember where I was. And I will try and do it once more. <clears throat> now I have to come up with something to say again during this time period. Yeah. <laughs> Did everybody else at least get to create their React app? See, it was easy for you. Good. Okay, so I wanted you to create two of them. And the second one has a more complex syntax. And that one is the second one here. 
it makes a TypeScript version. So the point is I want you to be able to go in and see the difference between the two versions. You can choose later on whether you want to work in TypeScript or just yes, I don't care. But um, I wanted you to see that it makes slightly different. And the trick is when you run create React app, you tell it to go get a script version called React Script CTS, which is in itself installed on the node print, uh, a repository. So it actually goes up the node and downloads the instructions to make a TypeScript app. All right. It's uglifying. That's always a good thing. And it and and the fact that it didn't work, I don't care because I had made one earlier, so we'll just go look at that one. Okay. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I want to show you how they actually look inside. So what I'm going to do is uh, I want to show you how to get down into one of the folders and actually run one of these. So uh, there's several ways to do that. One is you can file open folder. So when you open the folder, you'll see here I have React App Test. You select it, and that opens your folder into Visual Studio Code. Now, Mayan has some code in it that I was working on earlier, so it's a little different from yours. You will have more files than I have right now. But you will have uh, what will be consistent. You will have a source folder. That's where you're going to type and create stuff. You're going to have a public folder, and all it does is load index.html, the outside framework for a page. Then you're going to have your node modules, and there are dozens of these. And you'll notice like Babel, the thing that makes your transpiling, that's all included in node module. Somewhere down below, you're going to see ES6 stuff. And then way, way down, you're going to see React stuff. There, so React is actually in these folders here. The two you'll be using are React and React DOM. React Scripts is the one that actually builds the scaffolding. Okay. So I am going to open the other one that I did in TypeScript because this one I was playing with. So if I want to switch folders, I'll show you another way to do that. The other way to switch folders is to go into your terminal window. And in that window, I want to go into a folder. And Maya and I ended up putting test on the end, not important. Yours just has React App TS. When you go in there, then type code space dot. What that does is open a brand new window of Visual Studio Code with this current folder as the source. And apparently, I don't have it set up to do that. Darn it. But it might work for you. <laughs> I'll just open it the other way. All right. So, in the TS uh, version, this is the TypeScript version, it has a package JSON, it has a source, it has a public. You'll, you're going to see that the public is almost identical to the one that they have in ECMAScript 6. All it does, it sets the viewport, which is a smartphone thing, the car set, 
Um, how many people know what a manifest is for without reading the green com uh, comment? It's only for progressive web apps. You don't need that, but they assume you want to use it. And then down here, this is really all you need. You need a div with some ID. That is going to be where your app actually starts. Okay. So <clears throat> let's look at package JSON. This is a JavaScript object that defines what's going on in your project. Notice that it knows that you need React, React DOM, and this thing called React Scripts TS. It then gives you four commands. Start, build, test, and eject. We're only going to do start and build today. Test we'll get to next month. And eject is for somebody that wants to start a project and then have it, have them take full control of it so it's not under the, um, uh, the, the command line interface uh, rule. Okay, and then if you're in TypeScript, you're going to have these things here. These are the um, type checking. Okay, so if you want to start this, then when you see the script npm start, open up a command window with control tick, a terminal window, and you should be able to do npm start. And if that works correctly, it should open up a browser and load the application, and it worked. Then it gives you a little hint here. It says, hey, this is what you should go edit if you want to do something useful. Okay. Now, next step, I'm going to close that. I'm going to show you another way to do this. I'm going to control C to end my little built in web server. And the next set of commands in the slide is here. So we just did an NPM start. The next thing we're going to do is run build. And in this case, we're basically using Webpack. So we do npm run build. And let's see if it can build this. And it it seemed to have done it correctly. Did everybody see that that command actually builds a new folder or creates a new folder in your solution called build? Okay. That folder has the code that you would copy to a web server. So you don't copy all your development source code to the web server. You only copy the results of what you build. So what did it actually do? Well, <clears throat> bear with me here because I'm trying to get you through a lot of stuff. I want you to go on the left-hand side to app.tsx. That is actually the code that makes the page. It's a component. So. I'm going to import React, and I'm going to import that this is how you work with CSS files. We'll do that more next month. This is how you go get a, a logo that's a, you know, a media file. So I'm actually going to create an app, a class, and that class has to extend something called React Component. 
Whoops. All right. Okay. Now, you notice that it calls a method called render. Render then returns this. So that's weird. It has, for all intents and purposes, it has HTML in the middle of JavaScript. And that is what they call JSX. That is uh, Facebook's unique way to code this stuff to make it simple and fast to type. And notice that Visual Studio Code actually knows how to color code. So it looks like real HTML. When Facebook first started doing this, people got all upset because they were like, you can't do HTML in a, in a text editor because it, it doesn't do, you know, autocomplete and stuff like that. But as the tools got better, this style of programming has become more popular. <clears throat> Does this file make any sense to a browser? It does not. So what happens when you build, it actually takes this and turns it into something a browser can understand. Let's go through this exercise. Go to the bottom here, and you have to be above the, the closing div. Put your first name in an H1 and say something like, Bill was here. And you can do silly stuff here if you, okay? Now, when you're in Visual Studio Code up at the top, you can see that there's a, a black dot. That means you have to save the file. So I'm going to control S to save it. Since I'm not running a web server yet, it's I can't go and see the result. But for our exercise, what I want you to do is go back to the terminal window, and I want you to build it again. It goes pretty quick. And incidentally, when you do that, it blows away the entire build folder and puts a whole new one back. Now let's go see what it put up in the build folder. It put a copy of your favorite icon. It put a copy of index HTML. But what did it do with the index HTML? It minified it. It removed all the spaces and line feed. Okay, don't worry about the server worker stuff for now. Look under static. In static, it made two CSS files, but you'll notice that they are minified. It also made, whoops, it also did the same thing under media. Whoop, why, why do I, I got my finger in the wrong place. Under media, it put the logo there. It didn't minify that, but look what it did to JavaScript. It took all of your TypeScript and transpiled it into JavaScript 5 and then switched it all together. So if you go to that file, do a control F and look for your name. This is what the TypeScript turned into. It turned into that. Yes. That was created by the Create React app. Scaffold. It's just a starter, and what a lot of people do is they take the starter, they blow all the pages away, and then write their own. But, but that one was created with the TypeScript version of the TypeScript. Yes. Yes. Not the, not the. We'll go back and look at the other. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go back and look at the other version, uh, the, the ES6 version, in a few minutes. Okay, so does everybody see what transpiling does and how this stuff actually gets bundled together? Okay, now, 
Yes. Well, you might be in the wrong folder. React app TS should be the folder you're working in. If, you, if you're in the wrong folder, just go to file and open folder. Okay, the, the app.tsx file is under the source directory down here. So all I'm doing is explaining how this gets turned into something the browser can actually display. And you run the create app. Yes, okay. All right. So that was sort of interesting. Now, go back to your command window. And some of you may have already installed this. If you didn't, you can always try the command. But in my slides, it says npm install dash g serve. That is a web server. So you would do npm install uh, serve. Doesn't or, uh, the, the order isn't that important. And I may have already done this off the sea. There are many, many web servers you can get as part of Node.js. This is just one example. Okay, so once that installed, I can now use it to run a web server and the command looks like this. It's serve dash s build, At dash s means source. So I should be able to say serve dash, that, uh, dash s build. And that should start a web server at localhost 5,000. So if I go back to my browser, and I go to localhost 5,000, it's actually running my app from the build folder, not from the temporary folders it creates when you, when you do, uh, you're in development. So the purpose of that was to see what happens to your React application if you want to actually deploy it and send it into UAT or production. <clears throat> All right. Say that again. I could show it to you. Um, we were going to make it so that you could get a copy of these slides. It may be a little late, but uh, eventually that might be helpful. Okay, so you have to go to the meetup. Thank you, Rich. So if you want a copy of these slides, and you're going to want that very soon. <laughs> um, if you want a copy of these slides, go to the meetup page. There's a link, and Rich made it so you can download the slide. Shouldn't take you very long at all. Because what I did tonight is I put a lot of the source code right in the slide. If you want to save yourself some typing. All right, I'm going to move on to the next uh, section. So we want to learn how to make a minimal application. And a minimal application only needs a couple files. So I'm going to work with you to do this. It needs an index.html, index.js, and an app.js. These are the steps that each perform. I am going to go into, I'm going to close this down and stop my server because I don't really need to be um, running that anymore. I proved my point. And I'm going to go back and open my other folder for the rest of the night. I'm going to work in React app. Don't worry about my and having the dash test. That's just something I made earlier. Okay. So, in our app, we are going to do the following. In your public, you should only have two files. 
the icon and the HTML. Clean up your HTML so it just shows this stuff. In other words, delete the extra lines about the manifest and all the comments and all. So we're making a minimal React app. Technically, the only thing we really, really need is this. We need the div ID root. So there's a, there's a place to actually put our rendered component. And right now we're not running a web server, so it's not important. Just we're going to just make these changes. All the other files in public, you should get rid of. Just delete them. In source, I only want you to have two files. App and index. We're going to concentrate on index first. Index has to import both React and React DOM. React is the, is the library that can make components. React DOM is the thing that can take an instance of a component and put it onto your web page. So when you call React DOM, you're going to tell it to render something at this element. And if you get an element by ID, what element are you getting? This one. You're getting root. This technique is called bootstrapping. You're grabbing and telling React where you want to put your finished component. What is the name of your finished component? App. It can be anything. They, by default, they call it app. By convention, any component you make in React should be uppercase or uh, yeah, it could have multiple words in it, but the first letter should be uppercase. And that's so that React can easily differentiate it from a standard HTML element, all of which are lowercase. Notice that you have to import app so that React DOM knows where to go and find it. Okay, and the last thing I want you to do, all the other lines that were there, the stuff about importing style sheets and things like that, get rid of. The last one I want you to do is this one, app.js. No, you're not going to type what I have here. Okay, so this was some testing I was doing earlier on. I'm going to get rid of a lot of this so that we're both on the same page. Okay. So we're now going to try three different ways to make a React component. The first one is in the slides. It's called, well, I just showed you this one. See how nicely I formatted that? It's amazing what you can do with PowerPoint. Okay. So this is what I want you to do. Now, the problem here is I can't. If I'm showing this, I can't, I can't copy the text, <laughs> which is going to slow me down. Um, but we can sort of work with this. And the other thing I can do is tell it to stop doing the show, and I can do this. Come on. Stop it. OK, so this is the simplest way to do this. And this is called a stateless function. So we're going to make a thing called app. And we're going to just give it some JSX code right there. OK, and we're going to save that. So now if we have all this wired up correctly, 
the index.html should say, I've got an ID of root. The index.js should say, you want me to take the ID of root and replace it with a component called app. The app is in the same level on the disk as my index. What does app do? Well, app goes and makes an H1 that says go eagles and throws it on the screen. This is as simple as you can get. Okay, how do we know it works? We go to our, uh, our little terminal window, which most of us leave open all the time, and we do <clears throat> npm start. Okay, and I didn't want it to come into this window. Chris, you're going to show me someday how to fix this. I wanted it to be in the browser in this window. <laughs> okay, so I've gotten that H1 to show up in my browser. I understand that. But if you're if you have okay, I, I'm just gonna get on my uh, my my Microsoft Windows 10 pulpit here. If I have two desktops and each desktop has a browser in it, and I do something that opens a browser, where should it open it? In the current desktop. I don't want it to be the last browser I happen to use. I want it to be in the current desktop. So that is something wrong that Microsoft is doing. But they'll they'll get it fixed eventually. For development, it's annoying. It's just really annoying. Okay. So, is everyone excited and pleased that they got something to work? Excellent. Okay. Now, if you want to be clever, you can take and resize this and make it smaller. This is what, like, cool developers, cool developers do this. They make that smaller, and then they take this and they push it to the side. And they say, gee whiz, I can see my terminal window and my browser and my source code all at the same time. So we could do something like awesome eagles. And as soon as we control S, what should happen? Oh my God. Isn't that the most exciting thing? All right, so now we've gotten something working. There's not a lot you could do with a stateless function because you don't have a lot of room to write code. It's just a simple way to throw some HTML up on the screen. So let's move on to the next example. Just leave this the way it is. And I'm going to jump to the slides. Whoops. I said slide, not browser. Okay. And the next slide is actually going to create a standard component class. So I'm taking that code from the slides, if anyone can get that far with their slides, and I'm just pasting that in the place of the stateless function. So the difference here is that we're, we're specifically defining a class that extends React component. You must have a render method. You must. And the render method must return back one element. We'll get more into this later. Okay. So how would I know whether this worked or not? You just save it. And if everything's working, your browser should immediately display the result of the new function or, or class. Okay, 
So the three main points of a React component, you must import React, you must create a class that extends React component, and then you must, do, you must export the class. This is just the way ECMAScript 6 is designed. And it looks almost identical when you do it in TypeScript. Okay, the last way we're going to do a method or a uh, component is this. So I'm going to copy that one over to here. And the reason we're doing this one, somehow it messed up my quote. I don't know why PowerPoint would do that to me. But remember when I showed you the, the NPM run build? And the run build took TypeScript and transpiled it into JavaScript 5. When I did that, what command did it actually show in the JavaScript 5? Create element. So behind the scenes, this is actually what's happening. If you want, you could actually code at this level. Rather than using the simpler JSX format, you could just you know, go in there and make your own H1 package. I don't think that's as efficient and as fast, but it works. And you'll notice that this one purposely doesn't say go eagles, it says eagles. So when I save it, the only thing in my browser is the word eagle. So three ways to do a stateless function. You can create a class with a render method. Or you can go down to the create element. Uh, Any questions? Yes. I have no idea. Does anybody know what that default actually means? There are other tricks. He's asking why this is here. There are other things that can go there, but in my reading, it says you almost always use default. <laughs> so I think there's more advanced techniques somebody can use. How many people do Angular? Okay, for those that do Angular, syntax is very similar. However, in Angular, you don't have a render method. All of that's sort of implied. And instead of in Angular, you have the HTML files instead of doing the render method. All right. <clears throat> Next step. We're going to go back to JSX. And we're going to make something that has multiple lines in it. Okay. So in this one, I'm going to take the class and pop it in here and replace this class. Okay. There was a question from the group from the uh, online about is there a way? Separate the HTML, HTML file like an Angular 2. Um, well, he means Angular 5 because tell him Angular 2 is so old fashioned. Uh, but Angular 5 is now released. So, um, not that I'm aware, but I'm, I probably there is a way to make an HTML template file. Um, but it's seeing the way React works, you just make lots of JSXs all over the place. So the JSX can do what a CSS file does. It does what an HTML file does. And it also does what first code does. So it's like a multi-purpose tool. All right. So in this case, remember I said that JSX, you have to return a single element. OK? Watch what happens when we remove the, well, first of all, let's run this one to show that it works. Okay, seems to have worked. Uh, 
when you run to run the web server server you type npm start it's up here somewhere yeah npm space start and if you're not sure sir if you look over a package json anytime you click package json it'll show you the names of your file of your command so npm start npm run build all that stuff yes Not that long ago. <clears throat> OK. Um, dot presenting star presenting. But it was running sort of OK until then. I see. I must be going too fast. Is it still hung up? OK. All right, now. If everyone, if you got to this point, I want you to do this exercise because it's a good way to learn. Get rid of the parentheses. Do a control S. That's not good. Okay. So apparently you would assume that the return requires parentheses. Guess what? Put the div on the same line as the return. Now save it. Ah, that's interesting. I'm not sure I like that style, but if you put if you put a wrapper element, the div is a wrapper around all the other elements. If you put the wrapper element right next to the return, it accepts that. If you want to be a little more exact and declarative about your your uh, uh, your indents and stuff like that, always always put the parentheses, and everything will be happy. Any questions on, so that's a multi, I guess a multi element with a wrapper. Okay. All right. Now we get into some of the, we're, we're almost in the coding. So exciting. Properties. So properties are how you pass information into a component. We don't want to hard code beat eagles all the time. Well, you might want to, but it, you no. Know? So we want to be able to send a message in. And to do that, we're going to send in a property. When you create properties, you have two additional things you can make called prop types and default props. Prop types essentially is data typing your property. Default props is pretty simple. It's your default value. So I'm going to show you an example of that. Okay. So in this case, we're going to import prop types. And I'm going to take this code here. And I'll show you where all this goes. And I'm going to put all this here. Whoops. Now, if you want this to format correctly, um, I normally would have the prop types at the top, and then these things I would probably have at the bottom. And I like to separate things with empty lines. It makes it easier to, might even put a comment in there once in a while. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a message that is a string. And the string is going to be is required. This is just like C sharp when you use those decorator things above your method. 
And I'm going to make a number called score of the Eagles, and I'm going to make another number the score of the Cowboys. And just for fun, I'm going to make the default message, fly, Eagles, fly, because that's our motto. Okay, going back to the slides, because I can't fit everything on one slide. This is very clever. This is how we consume the props. Now, it's a matter of style whether you would put this above or below the definition of prop types and default uh, props. That's completely up to you. It'll work either way. So let's, let's read and see what's happening. So we're going to let the message equal to the props.message. Okay, and then this says, take the message and display it in an H1. Then it says, underneath that, we'll have a new line where I put the score of the Eagles and the score of the Cowboys. Now, you don't have to use the syntax let message. That's just a coding, a syntactical convenient. Because once you do that, then you only have to refer to message by its single, simple name. And notice that anything you want to display, you wrap in curly braces. In React, how many curlies do you use? One on each side. In Angular, you use two on each side. Pretty difficult change. All right, so does this sort of, does the code make sense? Pretty simple. Now, is this going to work? I always ask leading questions like that. Is this going to work? Okay, apparently it does. Okay. Well, no, wait, 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 wait. Let's think before we get to that. Just hold your question. So the question is, does this work? And the answer is, well, part of it does because I can yeah. see fly eagles fly, but I don't see the score. Why do I see fly eagles fly? There is a default prop called fly eagles fly for the message. So this will automatically be set to something no matter what. Okay. The thing we're missing here is if we're going to call and pass properties, we have to pass it from the parent element. If I go back to my slides, what you'll see here is I edited index.js to send the scores. <clears throat> so let's try that. Now I have to go to index.js and throw the scores into my parent element, the instance of the element. Okay, save that, watch what happens. Now the scores get passed in, but the default message still stays there. How would I override the message? Well, you can use single quotes, I don't need double. And one of the thing, uh, one of the uh, favorite things we say in my house on a Sunday, but you have to say this real fast. One thirds, one thirds, because <laughs> it happens a lot. Now, what happens if I save this? Aha! So now 
it's not using the default message. It's using this explicit message that I put in the instance of app. And I can pass as many parameters as I want them. So those are called properties. Okay. You could have used this technique to like go out and get data from a back end web server. Wouldn't know how to put it in the property. There's another way to do that. But this is a way when you're doing your markup to pass things from one component to another. All right. I will move on to the next section. The next thing you want to learn about is called state. State are things that will change, and you want to be able to change them. In other words, you don't want to hard code them into your markup. So state is going to live inside each component. And they talk about something called the context. The context is the current memory allocation for an individual instance of the component. It can have its own little set of data. Okay. To make this work, we have to do a geeky thing we have to call super. <laughs> and super establishes the context which allows you to create the state. State is sort of useless if you don't have a way to modify it. So oftentimes you have an update method involved with a state. Let's take a look at example. So this is the constructor that you're going to need. So we're going to copy this. And we're going to go back to our code. And basically, we're going to go to app.js and replace everything except for the bottom where it says uh, export default app. And I don't know why PowerPoint is doing this to me. You may have to fix up some quotes. Okay, so what's happening here um, this isn't going to work correctly yet because I don't have the top line there. I, I, I made a mistake and I should have uh, left the top line in. So let me let me do this again. I wanted everything underneath here to be replaced. There we go. Okay. So that makes more sense. So it should look something like that. So when you want to work with state, you must call this thing called super. Super creates this blob of data that you can work with, and it, and it turns it into this. And then this has something called state. And state can have any number of properties or, or you know, can have rays in it, anything you want. So during the life of your component, you change the data in state, and then the JSX, the, the HTML, displays whatever your state has been. So as you update state, the display automatically. So to make this work, if you try to save this right now, is it going to work? Come on. Absolutely not, because you don't have a render method. Oh, boy. We're in trouble. So I'm going to go back to the slides. My next slide actually has the update method, which is the next part. So if we want to do the update,
I would put that after the constructor like that. And you'll see where this is uh, move, uh, change, uh, used in a, in a moment. And then you go back to the third slide and the third slide actually has the render part of this. So you have to be a little careful where you place these. But if you're careful with your, oops, that wasn't careful. It's tricky going back and forth. Okay, so it should look something like this. Okay, so this has at the top a constructor. The constructor says, create this thing called state. Give it the following three properties, message, score, and score. Then down here, it says, in a wrapping div, take this.state.message and display it in an H1, just like you did with the props. The difference is that we now have an input tag. The input tag is going to use the standard change event, which JSX codes as on change. And it's going to call update. And it's going to bind this. That seems like an odd syntax. Does anybody know what this means in this case? <laughs> I'll give you a clue. This, this, this is not the same as that, this. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Okay. So this dot update means the update method for this component. What does this mean in the parentheses? It's the actual input element. So you're passing the input element to the update method of the component. When the update method gets the input what, what does the input have in it? Fly it up a little bit in your code. It has a target value. So the target is the input. It takes the value of the input and puts it into the message field. Where is the message field displayed? Inside the H1. Save it and see if it works. Aha. So the default state displays, so do the scores. Aha. How many Z's in Pennsylvania? My mistake. But now that we have bound an input to the state, we have what people like to call two-way binding. Anytime we change the input, it automatically updates the state with the state, which changes the display of the H1. It's like a lot of work to get What are you listening to? That's wrong. I do. I do. So um, eventually, even though Rick ran home free, um, uh, eventually, uh, what we should probably do is have a uh, lapel mic to walk around. That means I'd have to wear a lapel, but uh, <laughs> that's not going to happen. All right. Is anyone mildly interested or impressed by this approach? Yeah, seems like a lot of work to display just a little bit of stuff. But that's React. Once you 
once you start making these things, though, you can reuse them and things come together quickly. It is. I don't like it. If you don't like that, go to Angular, but you'll be confused by other things in Angular. If you don't want to be confused, use Vue.js. That one's the simplest and easiest to approach. You mean the stateless functions with the... Yeah. You mean like some carp carpenters use hammers and some use nail guns? <laughs> and some use screwdrivers and screws. Yeah. This is a true statement. All right. Sort of fun. <clears throat> so let's go look at another uh, example. I will not get through all the examples today. I'll get. I'll do my best to get through as many as I can. Okay. The next thing we're going to look about look at is using children. So in this case, we're going to start building something that has a constructor that with a simple message. Okay. So I'm going to take the constructor, and just to be clear. I'm going to replace everything and build it one step at a time. So right now, I only have a constructor. And yes, PowerPoint method messes up your final quote. OK, pretty simple. We're using state. We have one thing called message. Okay, then we again need to have an update, which you'll see is exactly the same as the last one. But to be thorough, I'm just going to build them one step at a time. That does the same thing that the last one did. Pretty simple. Now, this is the difference. We are going to use a child called cheer and the child is going to call the update method and when it does it's going to do the this this thing again okay and everybody knows what the br means go down to the next line pretty simple Okay, and I'll even get fancy here. I'll, I'll actually change something on the fly. I'll do a horizontal rule just for fun. Okay, if I save this, is it going to work? No, because it's looking for something called cheer and it doesn't know what to do. So your whole React page crashes. Let's go back and find cheer. So cheer can be what Chris Gomez just said. It can be a very simple definition of a component using stateless syntax. And by putting that down here, now that goes outside of our definition of app, because <clears throat> we can't define a new component inside another component. It has to be separate. Why do I not have to export cheer? It's not being used in any other file. Okay. So we have to export app 
because it's used inside of index.js. But since cheer is just used inside this particular JSX file, you can figure the whole thing out. What does cheer do? It says, send me the props, whatever props you have. In this case, the message. And what, what it's going to do, it's going to allow you to update the prop. So, <clears throat> this update, sorry for the group over there, this update means the same as this red word here. So, update is a prop that is passed in for each instance. Now, when you see this run, it'll make more sense to you. Okay. Now, what is a synonym for cowboys? It could be cowgirls. How do you spell cockroaches? Okay. Pansies. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them you can think of. Okay? But each of those instances of a component can update the state. But they're all updating the same state. So no matter which one I type in, it changes the eighth one above it. Just the way of passing data back. All right, are we going too fast, too slow? That was a too fast. Or a little. How about that? There is a lot to cover. Yeah. All right, so I will let them in on the dirty little secret. Are you guys ready? So if, did you get the, the PowerPoint? Okay. So if you have the PowerPoint, you have all the code I'm showing you, there's a way that you could sort of follow along on your own. Did I think this up myself? No. Okay. So I use, I like these guys. I, I'm sure some of you have Pluralsight. Um, but this is how I first learned React. I went and ran these videos. So this is egghead.io. And almost everything I showed you so far is the first five to seven lessons here. For each of these, you can go and like, oh, slow down, Bill. Sometimes they show you the code. Sometimes they show you the actual transcript of what the guy did. You can go and he explains stuff to you. It's very useful. The videos are much fast, are much better than I'm explaining. So if you really want to learn this stuff later, go to this site. And I actually pay for a membership because there's so many useful videos. Okay. Now, the reason I like this site for training all of these lessons are like three minutes long. So like during the day, you, you, you have a job, right? <coughs> okay. So you can't necessarily sit there like Pluralsight wants you to like sit there for seven hours and go through exhaustive amount of material. I like this because I could like, you know, if I'm on a phone call, I might like watch one of these for three minutes. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Now I know what a profit is. And then I go on with my life. And an hour later, I do another three minutes. So, but I like the, this guy. And uh, Egghead has, a, it has hardly any C Sharp, no Azure, but everything you want to know about Node, Angular, React, and Google. 
and there are, are uh, literally hundreds of lessons. So, <clears throat> but yeah, so I could see why I'm, I could see that I'm getting a little ahead and I probably prepared too much material. Common mistake, rookie mistake. 20 minutes left, I know that. So, um, some of you, I guess, are still following along the typing. That's good. Um, what I'm going to do, even though you, I'm going too fast, is I'm going to demo some of the other stuff. Um, if you want to try and do it, uh, more power to you. Um, but I will show you, I will build some of these other pages just to show you the concepts. And hopefully you get some value out of that. Oops. Whoa. What, what, what did I do there? I desktoped when I shouldn't have desktoped. Okay, so this one's really cute. Um, so I want to show you this one. This one's the render, uh, the render thingy. This one's really simple. And this is uh, basically how children can access the inner HTML of the child. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a button and a heart. What kind of button is that? What's that? Exactly. It's a component because it's uppercase. Okay, if this were just regular HTML by, by protocol, you would just put it lowercase. So it's going to create something called button, and inside of that, it's going to have something called heart. And I will show you where the rest of that is. That's right here. Okay, whoops. I didn't copy correctly again, didn't I? So control C, control V, there we go. Okay, and this one screwed me up a little bit. And that one I can do that, and this one I can do that. And I can format this a little nicer. Let's take a look at it. Okay, so button is actually a React component. And it's defined as, we're going to pass the props. Now, when it says pass the props, what does that mean? Well, since there's nothing between button and its closing angle, the props is actually the inner HTML. So it takes the inner HTML and passes it down here, and it puts the props inside a standard button. So now I'm going to have a standard button that says, I heart the eagle. What is heart? Well, heart's another child. So heart is actually defined as a span with a hearts in it. Did anybody know that you could actually do this in HTML? Just like there's an ampersand, and you know, uh, non-breaking space. Well, there's an ampersand heart. And wait till you see what this does. It's so cute. Isn't that cute? It makes a button that says, I love the eagle. But the, the point of this is that you can make all of these little tiny components in React, which is going to make it impossible for any maintenance programmer to actually figure out how the application is built. And this is excellent if you're a contractor. <laughs> because there's no way that the junior programmers are going to be able to figure out this. That is good for the bottom line. Um, so, any questions on that one? 
All right, you would. Yes. It's hard to, for me to be objective because I've been doing Angular for five or six years. So it, for me, and that just feels comfortable. This is more coding than Angular. And I don't like the way they do the HTML and CSS as much as I like it in Angular full five, the, the way they segment. But I can see why people run this because it is code intensive and people that like the code would lean more towards them. And this also runs faster than Angular. But, you know, it, the difference might like maybe used to be like this and now maybe it's like that. So, and what about Vue? Uh, Vue is simpler than both of these and faster. Well, well, look, worth a look at. Yes, Mr. Gomez. So there was a question. Making all three is like a different. Okay. Earlier tonight, I showed you multiple ways to create a component. This is one way to do it. You create a class, and the class returns a render method. The shorthand way of doing it is called the stateless function. That one is a stateless function. It's, they're just showing you two techniques within one project just to show you that you can. The trick here is in this phrase, props.children. Props.children equals anything inside the instance of a component. And when I say instance, somebody used the button with a capital B. When they did that, anything that's inside the open closing element becomes the children. So the purpose of this exercise was to teach you what children did. This was just clever confusion down here. Yes. It would get all of them. It's basically it's the same as inner HTML. So if you can if you can picture that in your mind, props that children is inner HTML. So you get that whole blob of HTML, and then you can get inside other components. You can react or you can react to it by the color react. It, it, as you nest these things inside of each other, it can get very complex. And the next thing in React is definitely more complicated than this. Yes. Um, since we're getting really low on time, I'm going to do one more example. And I'm, in that one, we're going to grab data from a back end. And that, that will make you start to think that this might be useful. I know this, there's just so much to learn. <laughs> Okay, so um, in my slides, this one's really cool uh, to look at, but you can look at the video for this. This shows you how to do events like key presses, copies, cut paste and stuff like that. Um, but the one I wanted to show you is the one at the end, which is called the map data constructor. So I'm going to finish with this. I'm just going to build this one up and then I'll walk you through it. There's a thing in here that we sort of skipped over the demo of. And I'll, I'll just explain it when I get this uh, pasted in here. So give me a second. All right. So, so far we have a constructor. Um, let's see.
Oh, okay. It gets me confused when it messes up my quote. Okay. Let me copy the rest in before I explain it. Okay, we need our render method. And this one's a little bit bigger. Nope, I, uh, it actually, um, I didn't do a copy correctly. I, when I go over here and I control C, for some reason, it's not always doing what I wanted to do. There it is. And that could definitely be the case. So React component. Well, that's not very useful. So this should be here. Oh, I see. Okay. So I didn't, I wanted probably a closing brace there. That would be my guess. And it's just a matter of uh, getting messed up with the copy and paste. That looks better. So now I have a constructor that creates an empty array called item. Okay. So we're going to take the data we get from the back end server, which could be ASP.NET. And we're going to throw it into an array called item. Okay. And I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Give me a second. Um, it will mount. Oh, that's my mistake. These guys here have to be inside this. That's what I screwed up. And I don't need all this stuff from the other exercise. So <clears throat> I'm almost there. Okay, and then the last thing I need is this, which I just screwed up by moving it. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a new component called person. The person is going to be passed in the props. You'll see where this is used in a second. It's going to make an X, H4 and put the person's name there. What is the name? Well, when you have a component, the component has a render method. In addition to that, there are a series of lifecycle events. So when the first, when the component first is created, it runs component will mount. So before it displays anything, it runs this little method. That's the perfect time to go out and get some data from the back end. So how do you get it? You call a command called fetch. Fetch goes to that URL, which you could have written in on Azure, you could have written in ASP.NET, anything, and it returns back a bunch of JSON data. It takes the data and throws it into item by doing this, set state items. So it sets the state and takes the items and puts it in that array. Now, because we have that, then, whoops, sorry. Uh, because we have that, we can get and, and do something clever in our render. So what do we do? We say take the items, which are come down from the server. We put the names and put them into a local variable called item. Then we say down here, items.map. That is a for each loop. So for each item it gets in the JSON array, it's going to create an instance of person and pass it the item. 
And another thing that's sort of annoying in React, you have to have, every time you loop through something, you have to have a key, a unique key for it. You need that in Angular. But technically, in Angular, they make something for you. So, they're passing in the item name and the item itself. So the item itself is the person, and the person actually gets passed into the props so that we can get the person's name. Now, without any further ado, I will just run this so you can see what it does. And it goes out to the internet and gets the names of all, not all, of a couple of the characters in Star Wars. So, so the, the map command iterates over them. And for each map, we have a separate component to make the line with the name. Now, this, somebody asked. To me, this is a lot of ceremony to get a bunch of names for Something like this is much simpler than Angular, because you, you wouldn't make a separate person thing just to display the name. All right. So, did you notice here that there's a thing called filter? Well, what filter does it creates an input field. If you type anything into there, I know this is annoying, but it does the this, this thing, <laughs> and it calls the filter method of your component. The filter method says, change the state and, and create a value for the filter. And if the filter exists, then it's not going to return back all the names, just the ones that are matched the filter. And that part is done right here. So if filter is set to something, then you're actually going to go through the items and you're going to narrow down the ones you want. And it's very simple. It's much simpler to see it work. There's all the L's. There's all the S's. There's all the O's. So it finds any name with that character in it. Uh, I think it does a multiple character. So if you do OW, uh, you could do a three. And Skywalker, all that stuff. So that, to me, is a, like a little more useful example. But again, the amount of code is not trivial to do something like this. And all of that stuff would just be, all that code would just be for like one little part of your screen. So any other questions? I, I can see what you're asking. You, it would be a lot fancier if you were going to actually send the filter all the way back to the server. They just give me the out of out of all of the 300 billion name or a million names in America, give us back just the ones that we need to That would be a little complicated. Uh, to do that, you have to come back in January, where we will try and explain to you that flux and redux and uh, RxJS. That's how you do it. So, all right. Um, hopefully, you got something out of this. I'm exhausted. Um, it's hard to tackle a new concept like this for a lot of you. You haven't done this at all. I will tell you I haven't done that look in your eye. You think you want to do this some more? It's interesting. So, for next month, um, we'll probably create a little less material so we can get through it. Uh, the main things we're going to look at are routing. So, we're going to make a multiple page app with a bunch of components. 
and show you how you would jump from one view to another. Um, and then we'll, we'll do a little bit of testing and also server side rendering. So hopefully the people uh, the people online were able to follow this a fair amount. Rich, did did they seem are they happy or there are both people still online? Oh really? Yes. So I should have made it clearer that I was copying and pasting. And part of it, the other part is scrolling up and down on it. Ah. We eventually sent links to the link to the meetup. A lot of people got very interested. Yep. Um, hey. Excellent. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully this is worthwhile. You like the new? Sp How many like the new room? Excellent. Yeah. So it looks like uh, Microsoft uh, kudos. I, I like the lobby thing out there. That was fun. Pizza wasn't bad. If there's any pizza left over, take it home. Heat it up. Give it to your dog, whatever you do. Are we offline now, Richard? I have officially stopped presenting and I am hanging up. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining online. Uh, we're going to end the stream now. It'll be available uh, as a video on demand here uh, for at least the next 14 days as part of the uh, Philly.net channel. Uh, we're also going to uh, take a uh, download of the video here and move it out to a YouTube channel that we're putting together as well that you'll also be able to find under the Philly.net uh, uh, username. So look forward to that if you get out uh, past 14 days, um, although if you're out past 14 days, you wouldn't be hearing this anyway. So. Um, uh, enjoy if you have questions or comments. Uh, thanks for everybody who was on the live stream and, and uh, was actively participating in the chat. And thanks to Chris Gomez, who was our uh, moderator for this. He did a, a great job pulling all that content together and, and keeping everybody engaged. So appreciate it. It's the first time doing it. And then uh, happy for uh, all the community who are around here supporting it. And look forward to seeing you all again in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Bye.